As you are getting your seats, I will get us started tonight. My name is Justin Dyer. I am the director of the new Civitas Institute at the University of Texas. We are an institute on campus that studies the Constitution, liberty, and markets. We're delighted for you to be here with us this evening. We're grateful to the Salem Center for Policy at the McComb School of Business for co-sponsoring this event with us, for Greg Salmieri and the Objectivism program in particular. Ayn Rand and C.S. Lewis were born within seven years of each other at the turn of the 20th century. And the events of the first quarter of the century deeply impacted their life in all sorts of different ways. But the most obvious, Rand, of course, living through the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, C.S. Lewis fighting in the trenches and being wounded in World War I. They both went on to careers as literary geniuses in some ways, novelists, writers, scholars. Their books are still in print. It's a rare feat for an author in the middle of the 20th century to have books still in print. Both of them sell hundreds of thousands of copies each year still. Their ideas continue to impact our world. And the idea for the event tonight came when we were thinking about and talking about Rand and Lewis both publishing major works in 1943. Rand's major success was The Fountainhead, published that year, and C.S. Lewis published a slim volume called The Abolition of Man. And both of those books contain criticisms of modern politics, of the modern state, of modern culture, the way that it flattens and impoverishes human experience, the way that it hollows out the human soul and limits human potential. And yet, their differences run deep. And so we're delighted to have with us tonight your own Brooke and Michael Watson to share their perspectives on Rand and Lewis to hopefully illuminate their similarities, but also their differences, so that we can better understand these thinkers and how they viewed the world. Your own Brooke has a PhD in finance from the University of Texas at Austin. He's the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute, best-selling author, podcaster, and entrepreneur. Micah Watson has a PhD in political theory from Princeton University. He's a professor and executive director of the Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics at Calvin University. He's the co-author of the book C.S. Lewis on Politics and the Natural Law, which has sold dozens over its, uh, over its <laughs> career. <laughs> The uh, format for tonight, I'm going to invite each of them to come up for 15 minutes and give an overview, your own giving an overview of Ayn Rand and Micah of C.S. Lewis, of their life, their works, their worldview, the way that they understood this challenge, which is part of the title of the event of totalitarianism in the 20th century, which might not be exactly the right word or exactly the word that they would have used, but how they understood what was going on in the world and what the threats to liberty were. We'll then sit down after that and have a conversation back and forth, and we promise we will try to end in time for everyone who wants to walk over to the LBJ library afterward. There's another event at 7.30 where Karl Rove and George Will will be talking about the future of conservatism. And so if you're interested in that event, I think just follow the crowd after this one and, and you'll be able to find it. Uh, thank you for being here. I think we'll go alphabetical order, your own, if you don't mind kicking it off. Can you hear me? All right, we're, we're live. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the Savita Center and the Salem Center for, um, for inviting me for this event. And generally, uh, I'm... Uh, I can't express how pleased I am to see both these centers exist and, and uh, come into being. It's, uh, I, I, you know, to some extent, I've been involved in conversations about the creation of these centers for years now, and it's, it's uh, wonderful to now be here um, at an event. So to talk about Ayn Rand's view of the rise of totalitarianism in the 20th century, and of course, I think the relevance of it to today, which I think is important, um, not just uh, 1943, but today, I think it's first important to understand her view of liberty and her view of freedom. I think the positive is more important, primarily because 
we can talk about the rise of authoritarianism in the 20th century, but the reality is the 99.9% .9 of human history has been authoritarian. What's unique and what's special about the modern world, what is new about the modern world, is liberty. Authoritarianism is just the state of man since the beginning. Whether it's tribes, kings, queens, councils, whatever the authority, church, whatever the authority happened to be, there have been authorities over us dictating our lives in one way or another and to one extreme or the other forever. Indeed, life for almost the entire history of mankind has been short, brutish, you know, horrible. I'm not going to quote Hobbes, but, you know, horrible. It's just been awful. What's unique about the modern world is how amazing it is. I mean, here we are in this auditorium, um, uh, talking, coming in from all kinds of places. It's kind of cold outside, um, not as cold as it is in Michigan. Uh, we're, we're amazingly comfortable. Uh, we're live streaming this. Anybody, anywhere in the world can watch. I mean, life is pretty damn good. And that's what's really unique, and that's what's really interesting. And yes, uh, we have to deal with this threat that authoritarianism keeps raising its head and trying to do away with this. But first, I think we need to understand where did this liberty come from? Because it is the thing that is special and unique. And to some extent, you could argue modern, new, or at least in its current form, modern and new. So what made human success, human progress uh, possible? Where does human progress come from? Where does the wealth, the life expectancy, the, the, the amazing spiritual values that we have today accessible to us, where did all that come from? How did we go from a world in which pretty much for 100,000 years nothing changed to a world in which we expect now progress, we expect now improvement, we expect now to be more free, maybe not everybody out there in the world, but some of us, the idea of more freedom is an idea that at least has some popularity in the world. Freedom was a foreign concept in the past. Right? I mean, I, I like to, I mean, this is uh, kind of a joke, but it's true. Hey, everybody watch uh, Braveheart, the movie? I mean, it's like a favorite. Everybody watches Braveheart, right? And the Scots, they yell at some point in the movie, they lift their skirts and then they yell, freedom, right? They march into battle yelling freedom. What did they mean by freedom? Is it the freedom that we today talk about? Freedom from coercion, and government, and intervention? It, no, it's we want to be ruled by a Scottish king, not a British one. A little racist. Thing, right? But that's, that's about it. There's no conception of freedom in the 15th or 14th or 13th century when they were doing this. This is all a modern conception. Or at least post-Greece, post-Roman Republic, a modern conception. So where does Ayn Rand think this freedom and human success, what makes that possible? And if you read The Fountainhead, which I hope everybody in this room has, and if you haven't, I hope that at least we say a few things that'll encourage you to read that, and that'll be, I'll, I'll consider that a success if, if I can do that. I mean, she really, to a large extent, gives the answer in The Fountainhead. She gives the answer in the character of Howard Rourke. Howard Rourke is the kind of man who moves civilization forward. Indeed, how did we get to where we are today? We got to where we are today by rejecting the mysticism of the past, the traditions of the past, the idea that an authority should dictate our lives to us that existed in the past. We got to the point where we are today because of individuals rejecting that, standing for something new, presenting an alternative, moving things forward. We got to where we are today because they stood up and created what didn't exist, shattering convention, shattering tradition, and marching forward. You know, a big conflict in the fountainhead is between this architect who's designing something new based on his mind, based on his values, based on his ideas, and the conventional view of, of architecture of how you should build which is steeped in the past, 
which is steeped in tradition, which will not accept the new, the innovative, the progressive. And indeed, throughout history, civilization has advanced because of men like Howard Walk, who stood up and did new things and said things that were very, very controversial. And what did we typically do to those people? Well, what the masses tried to do to Howard Walk in the, in the book, we condemn them, we attack them, we often kill them. Um, and then, you know, their achievements are just immersed into our new traditions that we move on and we forget about the hero who actually created it, who stood up against the authorities in order to bring it forward. It's that view of man as capable, as heroic, as capable of setting his own life, creating his own mind, his own soul, choosing his own values by the use of his own mind, by the use of reason that I think we have a modern world and we have the freedoms that we have. I mean, the world as we know it today, I think is a consequence of fundamentally two ideas. And when I say I, I think I represent, I think I'm speaking for Ayn Rand, although I hate to, uh, the pretense of speaking for her, but I think two ideas are basically the source of the modern world. And the two are the efficacy of reason and the sanctity of the individual. It's the fact that, and this, is, this comes out historically, starting in the Renaissance, but really in the Enlightenment, the idea of knowledge, human knowledge, is accessible to every one of us. It's accessible because we have senses and because we have a mind, because we have the capacity to reason. And as a consequence of the fact that we can reason, we can make our own choices, we can choose our own values, we can choose our own path, in life. And this is, again, it's hard for a 21st century audience to remember, to realize this, but this is a revolution. Because before that, you didn't have any choice about many things in life. You didn't choose who to marry. You didn't choose what profession you were in. You certainly didn't choose your political leader. Some authority dictated all of those, whether it was family, whether it was the church, or whether it was the state. They dictated your choices for you. And suddenly there was an awakening. Wait a minute. If I have reason, if I have the capacity to understand the world, I have a capacity to choose my own values, to choose my own path, to discover my values for myself, what do I need these authorities for? And it's no accident that out of the enlightenment we get all kinds of choices, not just political, but we get the ability to choose our own spouse, to, to choose our own profession. Another just side story. Do you know why Leonardo da Vinci got to be Leonardo da Vinci? Like, why didn't he become a uh, notary like his father? Because that's what you did. You did what your father did. There was no choices. You didn't get to choose your profession. Anybody know why Leonardo da Vinci could actually be an artist and an engineer and a, you know, a Renaissance man? Because he was a bastard. Absolutely. Because he was a bastard and therefore couldn't enter the guild and therefore was free to pursue his life to pursue his values, to pursue his choices, free of a tradition that dictated only one path for him, which was to become a notary. If he had been a legal kid, we would have never had the, 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 the wonder that is a Leonardo uh, da Vinci. So it is a capacity to reason which liberates us from those authorities. It's a capacity that says that you can make choices for yourself. And then it's you making choices. So implicit in that is the fact that you matter, that you as an individual matter. You're not just a cog in a collective. You're not just part of a group. You're not there just to do what the collective determines for you to do. And you see a rise of individualism at the same time as you see a rise in the acceptance of the idea that reason is our means of knowing the world. And I think those two ideas, um, politically culminate in the Declaration of Independence, politically culminate in the creation of America, a land of the free, a land that leaves individuals free to use their mind, their own mind, use their own judgment in pursuit of their own chosen values, where 
Those values are not dictated to you from above, where your life is not determined by an authority outside of you. And this is an historical achievement, I think the greatest political document ever written in all of history, because it recognizes the sanctity of the individual as a moral agent in pursuit of his own happiness. So it's these ideas, reason and individualism, that for Rand represent the, the march towards the, 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 the intellectual evolution towards liberty and freedom and the ideas of liberty and freedom that again culminates, I think, in the creation of this great country. And I think from that perspective, the rise of authoritarianism seems always to be a kind of return to those pre-enlightenment ideas. The rise of authoritarianism is always a hearkening backwards to some kind of mystical explanation for the world and a rejection of reason. Uh, you know, you see it right now. You, you know, why, and, and I know people have lots of explanations for this, but if you listen to Putin and, and, and in terms of why he explains his invasion of Ukraine, what you get is a whole mushy thing about Russia and the greatness of Russia and this thing called Russia and the spiritual thing of Russia and the unity of the Russian people and, and, and wanting to fulfill some mystical destiny that is Russia. I mean, there might be some geopolitical aspects of NATO or whatever, but that's not how he explains it. That's not how he motivates the Russian people to go to war. It's an explanation about some otherworldly cause that is driving his explanation. You know, the, 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 uh, whether it's the Nazis or the communists, they always have to create a mythology. A mythology that is not of this world. A mythology that says you as an individual don't matter. What matters is the Russian spirit. What matters is the Aryan race. What matters is the proletarian. Which I can't point to. I can't find that. And it's a, it's a collective. It's never an individual. You as an individual don't matter. Your life is subservient to theirs and should be sacrificed for their sake. So authoritarianism comes together with a rise in emotionalism, with a rejection of reason, and a rejection of the individual and individualism. The left, with its subjectivism, a rejection of any objective reality or any objective values, what is it left with? If you reject objective values, if you reject reality, what's left? Well, emotion. All that's left is emotion to guide you. Emotion is not a particularly good guide for action in life. If you don't believe me, just try it for just a few days. You'll get into lots of trouble, and you'll see. Emotion, if you live your life based on emotion, what ultimately emotion, one emotion will dominate all others, and that is fear. Because you will fail. You will fail. Without reason, failure is the consequence. And when you're afraid, you look for others, you look for safety, you look for collective to latch on, you look, and you can see this in the, in, in I think the, the modern, in much of the modern left, is so driven by fear more than anything else. And by this latching on to groups and, and huddling together and, uh, and packs, almost like packs uh, of animals. You know, the right claims that truth is revealed, that it's not discovered, but revealed, comes from revelation, and again is an attack on reason. And there too, if you can't discover values, and I don't think they actually are revealed from anywhere, you're left again with emotion. And again, I think you see more and more on the right, you see a, a, a shift towards more and more collectivism as a consequence. And less and less trust in the individual because we have abandoned the thing, the reason to trust the individual, which is what? Reason. His ability to think, his ability to choose, his own path, his ability, his ability to craft his own, uh, his own life. So authoritarianism is always a rejection of these two, and it always uh, bubbles up to the surface 
when there's significant intellectual um, pressure against reason and against individuals, individualism. You know, for, for, for 100 years or over 100 years from the Napoleonic Wars until World War I in which C.S. Lewis got injured, there was relative peace in Europe, one of the most peaceful eras in human history, a period of relative freedom, liberty, capitalism, and a period that was a manifestation of the enlightenment that just had preceded it, a period of confidence, a period that viewed human beings as capable of competence, as worthy of happiness, worthy of life, a period in which success was expected, a period in which progress was achieved from decade to decade to decade. But it's the same period in which philosophers undermined exactly these two concepts, whether it's Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx, the whole string of them, constantly attacking the notions of reason and the value of the individual, constantly attacking the idea that individuals had the capacity to discover their own values, to pursue their own values, discover those values using reason, using rationality, constantly undermining those that I think imploded with World War I. I think those ideas undermine, and as a consequence, you saw a rise in nationalism, and you know, we don't need to get into the whole causes of World War I, but here's a horrific war, a war one of the dumbest wars ever. All wars are dumb, but this one is, I think, has a special place in history. Millions and millions and millions died for their country, for their nation. Not knowing why, not knowing really what, what value they were fighting for, what, how it contributed to their lives. Just one of the greatest tragedies in history and in many ways, you know, changed people's perspective people's lives. Out of this war came not only ultimately fascism, but also communism. So Rand rejects authoritarianism. She rejects totalitarianism. She rejects all forms of coercion and authority, authority with the power to enforce. Because ultimately, she believes the individual is capable and morally justified in living their own life for themselves, for their own happiness, in pursuit of their own values, using their own mind. What we're seeing today in America is again, and I think this is where I think the fear of authoritarianism comes from, is again, we've seen over the last few decades a rejection, an ongoing attack on the concept of reason and individualism, a rise in collectivism, a rise in emotionalism, and all of those are leading us to authoritarian tendencies. We slowly, over 100 years, in the world of business, in the world of, of, uh, of markets, seen more and more and more and more and more regulations. And, and why, why do we regulate businessmen? Why do we regulate businessmen? Somebody said fear. We regulate businesses because of fear. We regulate businesses, businessmen because we don't think they're completely rational. We regulate businessmen because we're afraid of what they might do, even though if you actually play it out based on kind of market principles, yeah, there'll always be some crooks. But basically, businessmen don't do, you know, my favorite one is you, you walk into any elevator, I think even in Texas, and there's a little diploma on the elevator saying that a government inspector has inspected an elevator and it won't fall and kill you. Because we know that the best way to make money is to kill your customers. Right? I mean, you laugh, but all regulations are based on that idea, on the idea that businessmen will kill their customers because that's the way to make money. We don't trust their own reasoning. We don't trust their own mind. We don't trust their own values. To keep us safe, we need a government bureaucrat to do it for us. A government bureaucrat who you have to question their own incentives, but that's a, a whole different question. So the solution to the rise of authoritarianism is a rediscovery, and we have to do this constantly because I think this is what liberty requires, a rediscovery of those two ideas. The idea of reason and the idea of individualism. The idea that we as human beings have the capacity and the ability to live our lives 
based on our chosen values, based on our mind, based on our ability to reason, based on our ability to understand the world and live in accordance with it. Uh, and, and uh, you know, every time those are dismissed, stomped upon, ridiculed, that is fertile ground for the rise of somebody to tell you, well, I know how you should live. I know where the values come from. I know what values you should have. And hey, you're probably too irresponsible or too dumb or too what, fill in the blank to do it yourself. So let me help you a little bit. You know, the, the, you know there's, there's this book a few years ago called Nudge. Right? I'm not going to force you. I'm going to nudge you. But we know what nudges turn into pushes and turn into coercion very, very quickly. So I am going to dictate what your values are in whatever realm I think is important. And I, unfortunately, I see that trend on both sides of the political aisle, um, both sides of the so-called spectrum, although it doesn't seem like a spectrum these days. I see the tendency of, um, uh, again, uh, relying on authorities, relying on somebody else to dictate your life for you uh, from all sides. And until we discover the, 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 the value of reason and individualism, we are doomed to continue in that path. Thank you. There we go. How's that? Um, I'll just mention very quickly that the my co-author is also in the room tonight, and that is that is Justin. Um, and and we did I think each get a, a Cambridge University Press royalty check last month, and I took my family out to Panera. Um, so I don't. That's not nothing. Um, thanks to the Civitas Institute and the Salem Center for contributing to the intellectual diversity here in the blue heart of Red Texas, and at one of our country's flagship public universities. Thank you, Ron, for getting us off to a rollicking good start. Um, it is safe to say that C.S. Lewis is not known, first of all, for his treatment of totalitarianism. Lewis, yes, the Christian apologist. Lewis, the writer of children's stories. Lewis, uh, the, the science fiction fantasy author. Lewis, the literary critic. Lewis, the Oxford Don, and then chair of medieval and Renaissance literature at Cambridge. But in the almost 60 years since he passed away on November 22nd, 1963, we've come to learn more and more about Lewis's significant interest in and concerns about politics. This contradicts the conventional wisdom about Lewis, which was that he disdained and avoided politics. And yet we know that in every chapter of his biography and in several of his writings and throughout his personal correspondence, politics is at the very least near the surface and often front and center. Uh, with, with his concerns. One can find evidence for the conventional view, not least from Lewis himself. On November 16, 1963, uh, he writes back to a Mrs. Frank Jones, noting that, quote, our papers at the moment are filled with nothing but politics, a subject in which I cannot take any great interest. But then he goes on to say, it is an absolute certainty that we shall soon have a labor government within a few months with all the regimentation, austerity, and meddling which they so enjoy. Perhaps, however, it will not be so bad this time, for Sir Stafford Cripps, the late nursery governess of England, is dead. <laughs> so perhaps he did take some interest. Lewis was also steeped in the classical thinkers, particularly Plato and Aristotle, and so he was interested in justice and injustice. One classic definition of justice is to give each their due, and injustice is the denial of the same. Those themes run throughout Lewis's works. Uh, the classical definition, or at least one, of tyranny is to rule for one's private interest as opposed to the interest of the whole. We can think then of tyranny as injustice plus political power. And then there's totalitarianism. One definition here is a system of government in which the state aspires to control all aspects of life such that the public-private distinction is obliterated. We can think then of totalitarianism as injustice plus political power plus the technical means to apply that power universally and effectively. Lewis delivered the lectures that later became the abolition of man 
and wrote the fictional version of abolition, That Hideous Strength, primarily worried about a particular kind of totalitarianism, what he called Scientocracy. In a letter to a Chicago journalist written in 1959, Lewis acknowledged that tyranny comes in different forms at different times. He'd very much agree that this has always been with us. Ought we to be surprised at the approach of Scientocracy? In every age, those who wish to be our masters, if they have any sense, secure our obedience by offering deliverance from our dominant fear. When we fear wizards, the medicine man can rule a whole tribe. When we fear a stronger tribe, our best warrior becomes king. When all the world fears hell, the church becomes a theocracy. Give up your freedom and I will make you safe is age after age the terrible offer. In England, the omnipotent welfare state has triumphed because it promised to free us from the fear of poverty. It is crucial to note that Lewis believed the omnipotent welfare state will tackle real problems, real needs that demand responses. He says, we have on the one hand a desperate need, hunger, sickness, and the dread of war. He writes this in his essay, Is Progress Possible? We have on the other hand, the conception of something that might meet it, omnicompetent global technocracy. Say, say that 10 times fast, omnicompetent global technocracy. Are these not the ideal opportunity for enslavement? Whereas the classical liberal understanding of politics is that we authorize or empower the state through our consent, believing it will protect our rights, Lewis feared the modern state purports to do us good or make us good. We are less their subjects than their wards, pupils, or domestic animals, he writes. There is nothing left of which we can say to them, mind your own business, our whole lives are their business. What kept Lewis up at night was the combination of the tools of the omnicompetent global technocracy with how modernity, beginning primarily for Lewis with Rousseau, has undermined the very conditions by which people can believe in a genuine and objective moral reality. Lewis wrote about Rousseau and other seminal thinkers in his Oxford History of the English Language in the 16th century. For the ancient thinkers, Lewis wrote, pagan, Jewish, Christian, Stoic, the chief goal of philosophy and politics was to determine what ultimate reality was and what it demanded of human beings, and then educate, raise human beings so as to align with that moral reality as much as possible. With Rousseau, we have a rejection not only of natural law, but of a fixed human nature entirely, such that the nature of philosophy changes from discovery of and adaptation to reality to the endless possibilities of creation and innovation. Nature no longer provides the guide, but is itself the object of our power. Rousseau says uh, about his miraculous legislator in his social contract, this legislature must feel capable of changing human nature. Certain it is in the long run, Rousseau writes in his political economy, peoples are what governments make them be. Peoples are what governments make them be. What happens, Lewis worried, when those governments move first from protecting our rights to being charged with improving our lives and then seeing it as their mandate to improve us ourselves, to improve on human nature? What happens when the government is no longer a creature of we the people, but we the people are subject to be crafted, shaped, and molded by our governments? Lewis wrote abolition not to persuade readers of the truth of Christianity, nor even theism, nor even the superiority of Western civilization. He would hardly have chosen the word Tao, T-A-O, to refer to morality if that was what he was up to. His question is this, is there a moral reality woven into the fabric of the universe such that we can discover what is true about right and wrong and act accordingly? Or is morality something malleable a tool for the powerful, or part of an unguided evolution, or the flow of history with a capital H, something we need not discover, but now that we have come of age, something we can create and shape for ourselves. From Antigone's challenge to Creon to the serpent in Genesis asking, uh, did God really say? From Plato's battle with the sophists to Pilate's what is truth? From Rousseau's reimagined nature-less state of nature? to the truths that we hold to be self-evident, 
to Nietzsche's creative supermen, and today's transhumanists, this is arguably the question that lies beneath all our disputes and controversies. And one does not have to be a Christian or even a theist, nor dismiss Lewis as a mystic in order to find his argument sound. The prominent British philosopher and atheist John Gray finds abolition to be a trenchant and persuasive book. It is striking that Lewis does not appeal to divine revelation nor religious scripture to ground his arguments. Abolition addresses this perennial and paramount question about moral reality, and in doing so takes the side of Antigone and Plato and the Bible and Confucius and opposes Thrasymachus, Rousseau, Nietzsche, B.F. Skinner, other modern skeptics and current transhumanists like Ray Kurzweil. Whereas many of Lewis's works describe and defend the divine author of the moral law in both special and general revelation, abolition concerns itself only with the reality of the moral law itself and the stark alternatives to a belief in objective morality. Now we can't possibly rehearse Lewis's treatment here, but I wanna highlight three ideas that might provoke some commonality and some contrast between the two provocative thinkers that we're considering tonight. First, an education proper to human beings depends on the nature of those human beings. And human beings are both reasoning and affective or feeling creatures. But while both are necessary, reason should be in the driver's seat. Lewis understood reason to be more than mere calculation, insofar as he accepted the platonic understanding of a human being as comprised of reason, emotion, and appetites, the head, the heart, and the stomach, and the virtues that correspond with those different aspects of ourselves. Wisdom for the head, courage for the heart, moderation for the desires of the stomach. When these are in their proper order, we have the fourth cardinal virtue, which is justice. The point of education is to correctly align our emotions such that they correspond rightly to this or that value or this or that reality. Contra Hobbes and Hume, reason is not purely instrumental. Hobbes is wrong to say that thoughts are to the desires as scouts and spies, to range abroad and find the way to the things desired. Hume is wrong to say reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. Hobbes and Hume turn the human being upside down such that reason can only serve our appetites, our stomachs are in charge, and our hearts and heads follow. In the first chapter of Abolition, Lewis is critical of the elementary school books he is considering because they eviscerate the proper place of emotions and instrumentalize the guiding role of reason. This leads to truncating young people who will be ripe for any kind of sentimental propaganda that can feed the genuine need they have been denied. Recall Lewis says that totalitarian regimes always attempt to provide some real genuine good that has been neglected. Second, what reason reveals to us is a reality that does not depend on us for its truth. That is just to say that Lewis and abolition is staking a claim for a sort of moral realism, but doing so in an interesting way. He explicitly avoids speculating as to how it has come about that the universe really is the way it is. And while we know from his other works he has a theistic and indeed Christian explanation, he aims here for, if you'll forgive the phrase, a sort of overlapping consensus about what the reality of moral truths is and the sort of creatures that we are meant to be. Thus, Lewis and Rand can both oppose omnicompetent government while strongly disagreeing on two matters, important matters. First, the underlying explanation for why totalitarianism is wrong. Is it wrong because it tramples on the rights of truly remarkable individuals who are guided by rational egoism or is it wrong because it vitiates the good of creatures made in God's image, creatures the Apostle Paul, quoted approvingly by that classical liberal John Locke, describes as God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The second important matter is what exactly human flourishing looks like. Lewis and Rand each champion an understanding of freedom such that they robustly criticize overactive governments but their conception of what genuine freedom looks like could hardly be more different. Lewis, for example, strongly agreed 
with a Scottish poet and preacher, George MacDonald, who quipped, the one principle of hell is, I am my own. Rand, I suspect, would strongly object to this. But disagreement on these, in fairness, very important matters doesn't preclude agreement on opposing totalitarianism in word and deed. After all, the enemy of my enemy is, well, I can't quite say friend, given <laughs> Rand's marginalia of, of Lewis's book, although maybe now the bastard comment is a compliment. Uh, <laughs> but if not, my, if not the, the, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, maybe the enemy of my enemy is my frenemy, as the kids say these days. Finally, as I wrap up, Lewis's work in abolition and elsewhere continues to strike a chord, and I suspect this is part of Rand's enduring prominence <clears throat> as well, because technology has advanced far enough to render questions about re-engineering human nature practical and not merely hypothetical. While the debate about the relationship between morality and human nature stretches back to Antigone and before, the means to accomplish the abolition of men and women seems closer to reality than they have ever been before. Whereas the scientific experiments Lewis describes in abolition and its fictional counterpart, the hideous strength, had a definite science fiction-y feel to them in the 1940s, the modern attempts to transfer or upload consciousness significantly delay or even eradicate death and bioengineer coming generations no longer feel so far off in the future. If that's the case, then we do well to continue to have conversations like this and revisit these two very different but quite incisive thinkers. Thanks. Well, that was great. I enjoyed that. We'll sit down now for a conversation and I thought we could try to hone in on some of the differences between Rand and Lewis. And Micah, you had mentioned Rand's marginalia notes. So if you haven't seen these, uh, they are now published, but she kept notes on the books that she read. And she had a copy of The Abolition of Man in her library, and she wrote notes in the margins. And one of those notes she makes in the margins, she calls Lewis a, quote, cheap, awful, miserable, touchy, social, metaphysical mediocrity. And so the question, as she's reading Lewis and calling him this, and particularly the social metaphysical aspect of his mediocrity, was Rand a materialist? And in her account of reason and what reason discovers about the world, is there a place for metaphysics? <laughs> um, no, she's not a materialist. Uh, she, you know, the, the, the reality is that we have consciousness, and consciousness could not be just reduced to, to some, uh, you know, uh, uh, intersection of atoms. We have free will. She, uh, she is a big defender of the idea of free will. Uh, can they be metaphysics? It, it, I have a feeling we define metaphysics differently. Uh, yes, of course there's metaphysics. She writes about metaphysics, but for her, metaphysics is the, is the understanding of reality, is what is reality. Um, metaphysics has no, uh, you know, it, it would undermine metaphysics for her to bring up anything related to, to mysticism or to uh, some kind of spiritual realm that was outside of reality, that was separate from reality, separate from human consciousness. Our spirit is our consciousness. Uh, so, the, the, you know, man has a soul, uh, but her whole conception of soul is a conception of, of uh, you know, the values and the ideas and the thoughts that I have. For, for Rand, just to kind of, uh, off of the, uh, the idea of I, man has the capacity to create his own soul uh, by the choices of the values that he makes, but choice is crucial. Choice is the, the, the idea of, of, of will here. So, a, 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 a good man builds his own soul by the choices of the values, by the choices he makes in, in, in his own life. And, and that's, that's kind of the character of how it works. It's a self-made man, not self-made just in the sense of material, right? We all understand self-made man is the entrepreneur, he makes stuff. But for work, self-made man is the spiritual. He's made himself into what he is. That's what morality is. It's to make yourself into this, you know, a, a, a rational valuer, that, that walk, I think, exemplifies in the fountainhead. 
Mike, a similar question from the marginalia notes. Lewis, at one point in abolition, he criticizes Francis Bacon and the sci modern scientific method, and he compares it to magic, that there you have the two things that grew up together in the 16th century, science and magic, and science turned out to work, magic didn't, but it's very similar, he thinks, in all sorts of ways. And Rand writes, so Bacon is a magician, but Christ performing miracles is, of course, a spectacle of pure rational knowledge. Yeah. Ex exclamation point, exclamation point. So question about this defense of reason by Lewis in abolition in taken in context of the rest of his works. How much are Lewis's religious views really the thing that's driving his argument? In what sense, as a believer in things yeah. unseen, believer in revelation, believer in tradition, in what sense is he really devoted to reason? Well, he, I think he would say that that, that those things are completely consistent with, with reason as a capacity that we have. He just thinks that what we will discover with that reason has been authored by something other than ourselves, right? That we discover about ourselves. And I mean, Christianity, I think, is going to, is going to bring together in a way that we can't fully understand um, the idea that there's a something out there and then there's reality here, like in the platonic sense of the forms being in some other place and then there's us. Um, for, for Lewis as the Christian, there's, there is God, of course, who authors nature and creation, but then human beings are made in God's image, which you know, kind of blurs those, those boundaries of two different places. And of course, the central message of, the, of Christianity is that God himself comes down and, and becomes human. Um, with regard to you know, how much does he rely on reason, he does believe that, um, that what, part of what makes us human, part of our being made in that Imago Dei, is able to think about the good. And the commonality is that the choices we make will contribute to the sort of person that we are, um, but that there are better and worse paths to take there that aren't merely up to us. Um, so, you know, the, the, the Texas undergrad who comes here and, and works very hard and gets a degree and then decides to spend his life uh, living in his mom's basement, eating Cheetos and drinking Mountain Dew and playing Xbox the rest of his life, um, is not as worthy a life reason, what could, whether you do that from, from Christian starting points or other starting points, you could f kind of figure out that someone who takes their Texas education and does something a little bit more, becomes an architect, for example, right? Um, that that's, a, that's a, a, a better kind of life that reason could, could give us. That. So I, I think his Christian faith does ground everything he does. He said at one point, uh, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, um, not only because I, I see it, but by it I see everything else. Um, but his arguments, he, would, he explicitly denied he was relying on his faith in making these claims. I think they're at work there. But as we know, there are atheists and agnostics and people from other faiths who have read abolition and thought, okay, I don't buy all this spiritual stuff that Lewis writes about in his other works, but this makes sense, right? Which, from the Christian point of view, can work because even those who don't, might not acknowledge God as the author of their natures um, still believe that that nature is operative, um, and, and, and people can come to true conclusions. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what he says about Bacon is some of the more, I find it, some of the more disturbing passages in, in the book, um, partially because he equates magic and, or, or, or does a, a strong parallel between magic and science, um, which I think is, is absurd. But, uh, you know, Bacon is the father of modern science in many respects, father of modern philosophy of science, modern science. You know, the technology we have around, the, the quality of life we have around us, the, 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 the stand of living, none of this would exist without the Bacons of the world. Um, and, and to view science as, as, as something that, or knowledge more broadly, as something that just satisfies appetites, satisfies, you know, earthly appetites, is, is again something I think Rand is, is uh, remember these, this marginalia is for herself, right? She's, she's emo but I can completely get it because here we have this amazing industrial society, this amazing scientific society, and, and Bacon is partially responsible for this, and no, certainly knowledge and science is responsible for this, and you can't just say this is just for some you know, low appetites. No, this, is, this makes human life possible in the way that we live it. It, it. it makes us live longer. It allows us to enjoy our lives more. It allows us to pursue all the different types of values that, that, that we have chosen to pursue. Uh, you know, science is this major human achievement that, that makes human life possible. Um, and he is, um, 
belittling it or, or, or condemning it in some way. Belittling is probably the wrong word, but condemning it in some way, certainly. And, and associating with appetites. Or, you know, science is either, you know, there's this false dichotomy. Science is either uh, for good, knowledge is either for a, a good in and of itself, for, for, for contemplation or whatever, or for the appetites. But neither one of those is, is right. And the whole conception of appetites, I think, is wrong. I mean, um, this, again, is, is where the differences are, right? Rand, Rand rejects the idea that we're driven by appetites. I think, yeah, there we have not only a difference, perhaps, but a difference in interpretation. Lewis does not think that he is attacking science. He's attacking science conceived of as only man's being able to take over the realm of nature. Um, and his argument there is what science does is it, it can push back the boundaries of nature, but what it often does is equip some men to do things to other men. And often that'll be good things. Penicillin, fantastic. Yeah. Anthrax, not so much, right? So uh, the atomic bomb, and he has these, these examples, um, the radio, uh, podcasting, the good things, but then propaganda, also the same. Me so science is not just all advanced, although I think he would, if we pressed him, he were here, he would acknowledge it's, it's done a lot of good. Um, so I don't think it's all appetite. The, the, the main point of his book here is, is that so long as you, are, you keep in mind the human good and science is, is pushing towards that, then that could be really great. The danger is what happens when you put the human being, human nature itself on the table, what's left looking through the microscope if, if, our, if the goods and if, if a moral realism isn't guiding the hand of where these experiments are going? Well, but, but, but the, 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 the danger here and the evil here is not science. The danger and the evil here are bad people and, and, and bad intentions, and those have to be combated. That is, the science is fantastic. The science is good, and, and, and Bacon, for doing what he does in bringing us that science and acknowledging the, the power, the power for good of science is a good guy, not a bad guy in that context. So, yes, condemn the, the authoritarians, again, it gets into politics, the authoritarians use science or the evil people who use science uh, for destruction, uh, but that is not a condemnation of science. Science in and of itself is advancing human life. And, and again, if, if we measure the evils, the, the bad versus the good, um, you know, it's not even close. If we move from science to morality and thinking about one parallel that you find in both writings, but I, I suspect meaning very different things, is about the role of self-interest. And so I, I'd, I'd be interested to hear a basic overview of objectivist ethics and the role of self-interest and as, as, as much as we can do a short overview. And, uh, and then Mike, I invite you to respond, but thinking about it from this line that Lewis has at one point, I think it's in Screwtape, when he says that God is at heart a hedonist. Um, you know, he puts this in, uh, in the mouths of, of one of the devils in the, in the book, but the idea is that um, there is maybe a kind of self-interest rightly understood in both thinkers, but I suspect uh, very different in where they take things. Yes, I, I, I suspect so. so. So for Rand, morality is a guide to action, and it, it, it's a guide to, to your values, the guide to action. It's a set of principles to guide your life in pursuit of your flourishing as a human being, your success as a human being. So it's centered on self. Others, and, and the virtue of justice, uh, people getting what they deserve, uh, which you would accept that definition, is, a, uh, is the way in which we relate to other people. But morality is focused on what you do with yourself. Right? It's, it's about how you live your life, what values you pursue for you, and how do you discover those values. You discover them as a scientist discovers science. So you look out, you, you, you examine your human nature. What is human nature uh, about? You examine the world out there, and you choose those values that lead to success, given your nature, that lead to your success in reality as it is out there. Uh, so she is, uh, she is an egoist in morality, or, or, you know, because the purpose of your life is your own happiness, your own flourishing, your own success, your own, uh, and other people are important for that happiness and flourishing. So she's not an egoist or a self-interested advocate in a sense of go to the desert island and live by yourself, which is a caricature that's often made of her philosophy, but it's, it's absurd. And all of her novels suggest um, 
strong social interaction between people, strong bonds between people, and the value of that social interaction, both as traders in, in, in the material goods, that's how we gain our prosperity, but also traders in spiritual goods, in, uh, in, in friendship, in love, in, uh, in, in art and uh, in music. So Rand is an addict. She, she has a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. Selfishness as the pursuit of your self-interest how do you pursue your self-interest? By your nature, what is your nature as a rational being? You, you, the only way to pursue your, your self-interest is by using your mind. It's by being rational. Every value that we have in the world is ultimately a product of human rationality, ultimately a product of human reason. That is the ultimate value uh, that we strive. If you had to boil down Ayn Rand's morality into one word, which I don't recommend generally, but one word, it's think. Right? Think on how to solve the problem of existence. Right? We're not programmed to know how to survive. We're not programmed to know how to hunt and how to do agriculture, how to, how to carve uh, Michelangelo's David. We have to figure all that out. We have to use our reason, use our mind to figure that out. Uh, so this idea of... What role does self-interest play in, in morality? So there's a, there is... If you read through the Christian scriptures, uh, you will see calls for suffering, for sacrifice, take up your cross and follow me. And there are certain, um, I mean, that's in there. And, and there are parts of the Christian tradition that have made that a, a, an enormous influence. And, um, and, I, and I think I understand why. Lewis, in a, in a sermon he gave called The Weight of Glory, um, and it's, if you wanted to say, I want to read 10 pages of the best of Lewis, that's, what I, that's where I would send you, um, acknowledges those things. Uh, but says, if you look at what Jesus says in the New Testament, you're going to endure those things, but you're going to be incredibly rewarded, right? You, you take the last seat, the first shall become a last, and the last shall become first, which appeals to our own self-interest. Now, our own self-interest happens to be, from Lewis's point of view, the Christian point of view, integrally wrapped up with others. So love your neighbor as yourself implies you have to love yourself, right? Th that is there, but then that should also be motivating you to love your neighbor, and then there's the, the, the vertical element of that with, with God as well. So I, he, he does say that, that it, so it's hard to get in the mindset of, of another whole approach to life. But if you're outside the Christian mindset and you're trying to think, what do these Christians think? We actually do believe there is this afterlife where things will be really good. And, and, and that's, if we do have to kind of suffer or sacrifice some things here, the, the promise of the New Testament is you'll be rewarded many times over. And it's not a mercenary, here's a hundred bucks. It's, a, it's the reward that comes with being a sort of, certain sort of person. So it's the reward that marriage gives you of, of having a marriage with this other person, not that you inherit whatever money your spouse has. It's, it's the reward of a pianist of learning how to play beautifully, not that they get a, a salary. And so the idea of the, the pie in the sky idea for the, for the Christian is a real thing, and so for Lewis it was a real thing. So I actually think the self-interest there, self-interest rightly understood, if there's any Tocqueville fans here, um, would, would combine the individual as well as, as the neighbor, that Christianity tries to do both those things we haven't mentioned the fall much. That's what makes it really hard, and that'd be a difference. Rand is, you know, doesn't doesn't have that aspect, but that's at least on this side of eternity would be the chief stumbling but, block. There. I mean, the fundamental difference there. I, I I mean, there are lots of differences, but one of the differences is that that Rand's reward for virtue is here, right. and there's no suffering, and there's no uh, sac sacrifice of suffering. Sacrifice again, properly understood, because people people use sacrifice in all kinds of ways, but. Sacrifice, that's self-sacrifice, uh, giving something up with no return, with nothing in return. Um, she rejects that as immoral, as, mm -hmm. as, as bad, because it's, it's bad for your ability to, to benefit from virtue right now, today. Uh, and, and the same with sacrifice, uh, sacrifice and suffering. I mean, again, one of the, one of the parts, and maybe you can tell, maybe I'm misinterpreting it again, but, but one of the parts in the, in the, in the book, um, and I've only read the one book uh, from C.S. Lewis. So I'm, I'm limited to that. I've only read The Fountainhead, so we're good. Yeah, yeah there we go. Uh, <laughs> but um, it is, is the, the part where he says something like, um, you, know, you know, if we had to train, you know, if we're training children in, in, a, in a universal moral virtue, sacrifice for, the you know, sacrifice for your country. That, you know, that's, that's a, you know, dying for a country. Isn't that a beautiful, amazing thing? And shivers go down, you know, because I, yeah, I was trained that way. My, my country, I grew, grew up in Israel. That's how they trained us. I mean, we were trained to, 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 to think and live and 
pursue everything in aim of just a grenade. I just want the grenade to come so I can jump on it, be a hero for my people. And, and that notion of sacrificing yourself for the state as being this, uh, this elevated virtue, I find just horrific. I mean, it's one of the first things I rejected when I read Rand. Uh, and, and she freed me from that, I think. Because why? Why? I mean, if it's a good state, if it's a good country, if, if, there's, if, if, you know, if we're fighting for a good cause and there's something justifiable there, uh, and, and, uh, and, and my, 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 my fighting is going to lead to something positive and, and there's real, real positive potential outcome. But just to die for the state? Again, why? And, and again, this is in the context of not having an afterlife. <laughs> if there's an afterlife, uh, then, uh, then you can rewrite uh, all this as rewritten. But I think we can only deal with what we know exists. We've got two questions I want to ask to take us into American politics, and that's going to be a kind of on-ramp to the next event for those of you who are going over, and we'll wrap this up here shortly. But uh, both of these authors, both Lewis and Rand, have interesting connections to William F. Buckley and National Review magazine. And so on Rand, on, on the Rand side of the equation, William F. Buckley was at least partly responsible, maybe wholly responsible for ostracizing Rand from the conservative movement in the last half of the 20th century and wouldn't publish her in National Review magazine. And so a question about that, maybe a twofold question, what was so objectionable about Rand's views that Buckley treated her as though she were in the John Birch Society? And what relationship exists between Rand and objectivism and the broader conservative movement? How do those two things relate? Yeah. So. I mean, what, what, the way he did it, the way he, in a sense, uh, kicked her out of the conservative movement, not that she was part of the movement necessarily, but, but there was some uh, affiliated writing, there was some collaborations going on, was it, with the review of Atlas Shrugged that was published in uh, 1950, probably 58, um, and there was just a horrific review. Though, really, the, the worst review Atlas Shrugged ever got was from the National Review. Um, and... Uh, and it's, 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 I think after that review, it wasn't just that they wouldn't publish Rand, it was she didn't want to have anything to do with, with the National Review of William F. Buckley. Uh, so there was a clear split uh, of ways, and I think Buckley engineered that. He wanted that. Why? Because of her atheism. I think that was a big part of it. Um, I, I, I think it was, uh, so it was uh, just the, the, the whole morality as conveyed in Atlas Shrugged. You haven't read Atlas Shrugged yet, but... Uh, maybe, but you know the whole the whole sense of that book. I think uh, offended um, offended Buckley, and and he saw it as a threat. I think he saw it as a threat within the conservative movement uh, to present those ideas. So it really is a philosophy. Yeah, I, th I think he rejected it because of the philosophy. Now she, it's not that she wasn't then involved. I mean, she was somewhat involved in the Goldwater campaign. She had a number of correspondence in 1964 with Barry Goldwater. But Barry Goldwater was really the last political candidate uh, she, she had any affinity to. And she was very critical of Goldwater, but she viewed him as the best of, of, um, uh, of, of the conservatives. Uh, she, she viewed him as the best because he was relative to, to everybody else, relatively unapologetic about capitalism and his defense of capitalism and tough on the Soviet Union at the time in ways that uh, others were, were selling out. Uh, she condemned him because she thought, because of his, that he uh, based his defense on capitalism on religion. So she, she condemned that. And I think post-Goldwater, her relationship with an attitude towards the conservative movement deteriorated. She was very opposed to Ronald Reagan. Um, uh, abortion became a much bigger issue for her in the 1970s. Uh, so she was a big supporter of Roe versus Wade, and, and she was a big opponent of... Uh, of Reagan over the issue of abortion, but generally she feared the mingling of religion and politics. She saw the moral majority, the Ronald Reagan bringing in the moral majority into the Republican Party as a religious takeover of the Republican Party, and she feared that. I think, looking back, she she was right to fear it. I, I, you know, I think religion and politics have become much more uh, uh, much more immersed within the Republican Party since then. Uh, but so, and she, she did, she has a, if you can see it on YouTube. It's a, it's a, it's a great little video. I encourage everybody to watch it. Um, where she basically, uh, you know, she talks about why 
Uh, she thinks conservatism is a dead end. Why it, 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 it cannot be successful, it cannot revive America, uh, and it can never be a defense, a proper defense of capitalism. So uh, she, she, I think in the, more in the 70s than the 60s, became a, uh, a, a real critic of conservatism and, it, and kind of the, 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 the introduction of religion into politics um, in the way it was introduced in the 1970s. The connection here with Lewis is that at the turn of the century, the last century, National Review put together a list of the top 100 books of the 20th century, top 20, whatever it was. And Lewis, The Abolition of Man, ends up as number seven on the list. And so the editors of National Review pick The Abolition of Man as the seventh best book in the 20th century, according to their calculation. And there's an odd question here, which is, why would a book written in the 1940s by an English professor at Oxford given as a series of lectures at the University of Durham on how we teach English language to high school students, how does that end up being one of the best books on American politics? You didn't, yeah, so I can, you, I can, you can now know that he didn't tell us these questions in advance. Um, I, I think that what abolition does is it a lot of a lot of defenses of natural law and a lot of people will see the american experiment in part based on natural rights and natural law attempt to or act as if natural law is the thing that has to be defended and it's up on the dock and we'll have a trial and we'll see if it survives the charges or not and what abolition does is it turns the tables and it says all right let's let's say that that uh, this isn't right what are the alternatives to a belief in objective morality if you're going to go with some other approach besides a, a morality that is that, that we discover and that is real, um, what does that look like? And, it, and so it's, it, it's an offensive book uh, in that sense. And, and if you look at some of the people that have found it meaningful um, from across the spectrum, we have a number of different philosophers of different religious and non-religious backgrounds. There's something about that, um, that, there's, that Lewis here is trying to make the case that you start with a, a morality that is part of the, the furniture of our existence. Um, in a similar way to the, the math is, a, is part of our existence. And, and that is going to be a bedrock that can speak against authoritarianism on the right. And we've seen more of that of late with people who say, whatever needs to get done, let's do that, or they'll do it to us, which is a rejection of moral reality, in my own view. It's hard to get you know, preachy. As well as uh, excesses on the left. Um, so I don't know. That's what National Review is thinking. But that would be my answer as to what this book does, as it says... Um, it, it puts the alternatives on trial, and if you read through that, you think, yeah, maybe I need, to, Lewis's aim here is to think, is get us to say, maybe I need to give this moral reality, um, maybe Rousseau didn't have it quite right, we need to go back to that, and then we're going to have these great debates with, with Randians and Louisians about what that moral reality looks like, but that's on a different side than a sort of will to power, there is no moral reality, we created ourselves, um, and then just see what happens. So it's a, it's a, it's a boundary um, authoring book, I think. What's well, a good place to stop in the, the invitation for continued discussions about this? These are important ideas. We're grateful that you chose to spend part of your evening with us tonight, and we're grateful that you both came out to talk about this. Thanks, Mike, and you're on. Thank you. Thank you.